bring us back to the lake this morning. God bless you. Let's worship together. <laughs> Hopefully I'm loud enough this morning. I'm usually not very loud. Everybody tells me anyway. Um, a couple of songs, slightly, we're already a uh, hymnal song that we're going to sing this week. So the first song we're singing is Victory in Jesus. Um, if you don't have a hymnal in your chair, there's a couple of extra ones up here in the front row. Um, Victory in Jesus is uh, page, or, uh, number 352 in there. <laughs>
The next song I printed out enough pop, uh, as many copies as I could this morning of Cornerstone before I ran out of paper. Uh, so hopefully it made it around pretty uh, far around the whole sanctuary. Uh, but we're going to attempt this uh, next song. <laughs>
We still have data that they can pull up on their own, possibly. That's what I'm doing. Um, then no obligation was there. So please, uh,
we're here in uh, just a minute, um, uh, we wanted to take a minute um, just to kind of um, uh, recognize and kind of highlight and kind of update uh, uh, you all a little bit of what's going on. Uh, so if I could, um, <coughs> with, with Russ and Aaron Tinney, please come to share out there somewhere, right? Yay! Can we clap? <laughs> so, um, so you guys have been, uh, where do y'all want to go? <laughs> Um, so uh, they've been with us for I'm not even sure how long. About a year. About a year. Okay. And, um, and we've been really, really excited about the time they've spent here with us and uh, the way that they just immediately got plugged in and started being involved and, and, and leadership. They knew they couldn't spend out the kind of the leaders in Christ that they could they could just sit. They knew they had to kind of do. But um, we knew that about them and God knows that about them and, and He knew that hey, I have bigger things or I have other things for you to do. I don't want to call them bigger. Um, but I'll just say other things you need to do. So I'm going to let them share a little bit about what's going on in their life, and then we're going to kind of pray for them and um, do a little more information after that. So, um, what's that? Yeah. Very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to tell you an update in our family uh, situation, um, and it's one of those uh, kind of bittersweet moments. There's some really good in it, but it's also kind of uh, uh, tough. But, um, Aaron's pregnant. No. <laughs> Part of our testimony, you know, um, I know God's going to take care of me, and I expect He's going to provide. There's 
there's plenty of stuff to do out there, uh, other areas of initiative. So, so I'll still be uh, pursuing that, continuing that, um, and finding that problem there. But this is a call on one's life, and we uh, just cannot deny that. Yeah. Hey, Russ. I'm probably not the only one that didn't hear her. What is she going to be doing? Where? It's a, um, she's going to be working with a program that works with students with intellectual disabilities, but it's on that police level. So it won't be like a, a what state program. Ohio. Not learning, yeah, Ohio. Oh, good, good state. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, we just like Maddie and Landon so much. <laughs> that God is ordaining things all around in every step of the way, in every uh, bit of the process. And uh, we're excited for them, we're excited with that means for here and just all across the board. So uh, and like I said, a little bit of a timeline, Aaron leaves this week um, and the youngest girls and then um, Russ and Abby are gonna be around for a while while they work on the sale. Um, we're gonna actually have a, a more kind of formal celebration for them to kind of celebrate their time here and send them off on September 3rd, which is that Sunday. Uh, she'll actually be back that week for some other things with students and district stuff. Uh, so we're gonna kind of plan that Sunday to kind of uh, really recognize and celebrate them. So, so don't hug them today. So grateful uh, uh, for the Tenney family uh, being allowed to uh, be sent our way for this period of time. Lord, um, your your plan is greater than ours. Uh, for selfish reasons, we'd love for them to stay here and continue to invest in this church and their family in this uh, community. But Lord, uh, you have different plans, and, and we don't want to get in the way of those plans. We know how difficult these last couple weeks have been for Russ and Aaron uh, to have to make this decision for their family. But Lord, we know that you're in it. They've seen the different signs. Uh, they've, they've heard your voice, um, Lord, and it's not done yet. They're not there, so there's a lot of things that have to happen over the course of these next couple of weeks. And Lord, we pray that you're in every single step of the way, from the journey from Birdsboro to Mount Vernon and Mount Vernon back to Birdsboro and Sylvia, and for the sale of the house and for the new home that they'll create and they establish as they get out into that uh, university setting. Lord, it, it takes um, a special gifting, it takes a special ability, it takes a special willingness to be able to call to this area of ministry that, that Aaron has been called to. Lord, you've used her in such amazing ways in, in the mission field that she's already been at for these last number of years up in the Schuylkill Valley area, Lord. And we know you've got even better, bigger things. Um, but Lord, the lives that she's already touched are already blessed because of that ministry that you that she's poured into those students and for using her. Lord, and so we just pray for a special anointing on Erin um, over these next couple weeks as she gets settled in, she develops the curriculum, she meets her staff, she gets to know the students. And Lord, we know that you're going to be in every, uh, every step of that a journey for Erin and, the, and that, uh, that campus. Or not Vernon is blessed to have the Tenney family coming to be a part of them. And uh, Birdsboro is going to be, be there right with them, uh, praying for them every step of the way. Lord, we also thank you for sending additional guardians for Landon in this coming fall semester. We know that Maddie is in good hands there, but Landon needs the Penny family in his life. And so we pray for that Thanksgiving. Lord, um, we pray for Russ. We know as a dad, this is a difficult position to be in. To, you know, you want to encourage and you want to support, but yet there's, you know, you're leaving behind friends, you're, you're leaving behind a daughter to finish that senior year. And Lord, we know that there's still things there to work through, but be with Russ. Give him a sense of peace. Uh, affirm him that he knows that this is the right decision for their family, Lord, and, and, and allow him to be there to support 
uh, Aaron uh, in this new ministry. But Lord, we know that you have something special in store for him as well. And so whatever that is in your timing, we pray that you'll present that to us and allow him to pray through that opportunity and then just allow him to just hit it out of the park, Lord, in terms of what he has in store for you. And for these girls, Lord, this is a ministry move for them as well. We know that wherever you uh, land them, in whatever youth group, in whatever church, Lord, we just pray that they'll be a light um, within that group and that they'll uh, set that godly example. Um, thank God for the Christian home that has raised them and, and taught them the right way. And Lord, I know this is not easy. Being a, a pastor's kid and moving around, um, that, it, it comes with challenges, but it also comes with some incredible opportunities. They're going to get to know people that they never would have had a chance to get to know if you wouldn't have sent them in this direction. So, Lord, right now, this comes with an, a, a roller coaster of emotions. We've got tears because we're grieving the loss of some friends a, a state away, let alone Ohio, of all places. But, Lord, we also know that these friends are here for life, Lord. And we know they have a place that they can call home when they come back here to Birdsboro. And, Lord, uh, as the church family, we'll continue to pray for them. We'll continue to stay in touch with them. But, Lord, we know you've got this. And, uh, Lord, we just send them on, our, on their way uh, with, with your blessing, with your anointing. Uh, and, Lord, in all these things, the church says, Amen. Amen. As they're all sitting, ushers, you can maneuver your way forward. While you guys are doing that, I want to make an announcement. Real quick, okay? Remember, we can't turn up your hearing aids so you can hear me, okay? And if you look at the spectrum watches and alarms for five after a Yeah, I don't um, I don't normally this may shock y'all, but I don't normally pay attention to the clock in the back anyway. So this is not really gonna make any difference whatsoever. No, that's not true. I absolutely pay attention to the time. Too much so because uh, we're just emotions and all. So uh, but but um, as the ushers are coming back forward, I would encourage you to uh, I think we probably said earlier you continue to uh, be faithful and consistent in your giving. Again, it is not something we're saying from you, it's what God does for you. Um, student or kids, you can actually uh, head to the back or to the back uh, outdoors and downstairs, and you're going to have a candlelight uh, children's service. This is, oh, that'll be awesome. Candlelight children's service. Um, but always, uh, it, with regard to giving, it is what God uh, wants for you, not what we're trying to take from you. Uh, God wants his people to be and he blesses us when we are obedient. So I'm going to try to talk loud, uh, loud, not fast. I don't know if I can separate the two. We'll see how that goes. Um, but, uh, but, but I would definitely say, if you're like, hey, I can't quite hear, uh, maybe come up a little bit. There's plenty of seats on the front row. And if you want to hang out right here, we'll pull this chair up, and you can kind of sit right here, and I'll just kind of talk directly to you. Not me. <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> Give it a 
questions. We want to answer and address the questions that people have out around us. Because there are questions that non-believers and unbelievers have about the way the world works around us. And, and some of these questions, many of these questions, keep them from believing in or having faith in or even in the existence of our God. Some of them, they're not trying to get to the bottom of anything. They're just trying to, 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 to get, get you on something. But some people legitimately have these questions. And so the basis for this is what we got from 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Normally this will be here. You're going to have to look it up on your own, or you can just remember. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And if you remember, there were four underlying phrases that we had in that last week. The first one was, in your heart. This idea is that we want to, in your heart, set Christ as Lord. Honor Christ as the Lord. We want to be set means that we believe God's word is true. Not blindly, not stupidly, not someone said it and I believe it, I'm just going to believe it for the rest of my life, but we have challenged it, we have pressed it, we have asked the questions, we have done the research ourselves, and we have come to the same conclusion. I believe this to be true. We're constantly ratifying and enforcing the belief that we have in who God is and what he does in our life. And so that's that idea of being set to begin with. It isn't about helping yourself up with head knowledge, it's about having a heart knowledge of who God is. The second one is always. It's saying always be prepared. Always means you get up and you, you spend your time in the Word of God every day. Always means it, it's not when I, I think the pastor might call me to pray today, I better get ready to say something. It means always. It means you're constantly in this relationship with God. You're constantly poured into worship of Him. You're constantly poured into prayer and communication of Him. Always. Because if you're not always in Him, then you will not be able to answer the questions the world has because you don't know them yourself. And so the third one is defense, and the original word is apologia, where we get the idea for apologetics in this series. And, and it is a speech in defense, particularly in, in a court of law. And what we want to get at is that is two sides. We never want to be, we never want to attack the person that has the statement or the belief. We want to attack the belief, not the not the person. Attack the belief is what we want to attack on that. And, and the other part of that, I think, is if we're going to defend something, we have to listen to what's actually being said. We can't come in with our own ideas, with our own presuppositions, and go, here's what I think you need. And, and that is not the question that they have. We have to listen so we can give answers and responses to the questions that they have. And then finally, said to do it with gentleness and respect. God did not put you on this earth to win arguments, despite what you may think, despite how good you are at this one Facebook. That is not your purpose in life, to be here and win arguments. Your purpose in life is to make disciples. And if you're obnoxious, and if you're arrogant, and this falls on both sides of the, of the line, if you're obnoxious and you're arrogant, then you are not going to make disciples. You're not going to convince people. You are not going to win them over to your cause. You are pushing them farther away from anything you, you say or believe if you're obnoxious and arrogant in those beliefs. And so last week we kind of laid the groundwork that, that, that it's really important for us to join in the discussion. It's really important for us to hear the questions that people actually have. It does us no good to kind of come in with our own armed answers, ready to just rapid fire on them. We need the questions first. And so one of those questions that we introduced last week is, is one that I think is fairly common. And you don't have to interact with non-believers or, or anyone, for that matter, for a very long period of time before this question in some form or fashion will come up. It, it's worded in many ways, but the idea is the same. And if you want to write this one down, you can. You're going to kind of work and take notes. But, but it's worded in, in many ways, but this is it. Why would a good God allow pain, evil, and suffering in the world? In some way, we ask that question. If, if God is good, then why does evil exist? Or if, if God is good and he knows that how to fix it, why doesn't he fix it? We get into the questions of God's power and so on and so forth. But why would it work in all kinds of ways? Why would a good God allow evil, pain, and suffering in the world? And the presence of evil is one of the most discussed objections to the existence of God. It is one of the biggest reasons. It is one of the main reasons. It is one of the ones that we hear over and over as to how unbelievers justify their unbelief. If he was a loving God, he would do something. He doesn't. He doesn't exist. I'm not believing in him. That's how it goes. In fact, many, faith, many atheists kind of point to this fact that because there is injustice, because there is pain and suffering in the world, that that absolutely proves that there is no God. Because if he was good and kind and loving, he would do something about it. The argument usually goes something like this. Since there are so many cases of significant pain and suffering in the world that God could easily prevent. Like, we believe he has the power to really do it. And since there are so many cases that God could easily prevent, the fact that all of this evil 
was not prevented and is not being prevented means that God does not exist. That's the gist of the argument. And, and so that's kind of what we want to discuss and kind of talk about. What I'm going to talk about, you guys are going to listen to for the next couple of minutes. But before we get too far in that discussion, I, I want to settle your fears about it. Because it's a question you've probably avoided in many cases because we don't know how to answer it. And so I want to settle some fears you may have about this question because here's what I found this week. And as always, if I'm wrong about something, you let me know. I will correct my thinking and you'll hear about it. I, it, I, it is possible. I can't do that. But here's what I kind of found this week. And I, this, is a, this I do want you to write down. I want you to get this. I want you to put an exclamation and point that in. Eliminating God has not solved the problem. Eliminating God has not solved the problem. Taking God out of the equation has not solved the problem of evil and pain and suffering. Here's what I mean. Take, for instance, atheism, the non-belief in God, relying instead on science and reason. Science has brought us some amazing advancements in early detection of, 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 of natural disasters, in, in the fields of, of medicine and prolonging health and life and all of these things. But science has not prevented poverty. Science has not put an end to warfare. In fact, science is why we have gas chambers. Science is why we have atomic bombs. Science in place of God, in place of God has not diminished evil. If anything, it has allowed us to perform it more efficiently. Getting rid of God and putting in silence, science instead did not solve the problem of evil. It is still here. Or how about humanism, which is, a, a, which is a growing belief in the world around us? It is a system of thought that attaches prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanists believe, humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, that we are good people, is what it gets at. It puts the word potential, but you wouldn't call your whole movement humanist if you didn't believe that people were, were good people. And so I was reading an article this past week in which a humanist and medical doctor, George uh, Thiebault, uh, he's been speaking on behalf of the, uh, the Gold Foundation, which is an organization that, that champions humanism in healthcare. You won't care about any of that information, but you know, this is who it was. He, would, he was speaking on uh, the, 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 the conflict, the war that's kind of going on in Russia and Ukraine, things like that. And this, was, this article was about six or seven months old or something like that. But this is what he said. He says, these tumultuous and uncertain times demand of us the greatest possible expression of humanism. This is his claim. This is good. We have to be better humans right now. We have to let the good come out. And then he went on to describe the Ukraine crisis, and he says, through the scenes of rubble and destruction, we see humanity. Humanity and the healthcare heroes dodging artillery as they work tirelessly on the front lines of conflict. Humanity and those rising to defend their homes, their country, and democracy at large. Humanity and the charitable donations and mobilization here in the United States and around the world. And he's right. We have witnessed incredible heroic acts by individuals. Whenever tragedy strikes, you see those people. But he seems to be forgetting that other humans are also the source of that unspeakable violence. And so the dismissal of God and the, and, and, the, and the escalation of humans as the top priority, as the end all be all of all things, has not solved the problem of evil and pain and suffering in the world. Or how about the Hindu Buddhist belief of karma, that things happen to someone as a result of their previous actions? People who do good will experience good, and people who do bad will experience bad. That means that if we see someone suffering, if we, if we see evil, we can conclude that they did something wrong to bring that on themselves. The problem with karma comes when we see bad people, by our own definition, we describe, we describe, we define what bad means, and it means something different for all of us, for many of us. But when, when we see bad people do horrible things, Yet they seem to live a, a life that is rewarding and, and, and a life that is full of plenty. And then on the opposite side, we see good people, again, by our own definition, who do good things, yet they live in misery and pain. And so even with karma, there is still unresolved, unnecessary, and unexplained evil. Even with karma, unnecessary, unresolved, and unexplained evil. It is still out there. Things still happen that we do not understand. It's exactly what's going on when they're questioning Job. And they're like, hey, clearly you did something wrong. You should probably confess whatever it is. And Job's like, no, no, I didn't do anything wrong. And by the end of the story, Job's praying for his friends because they're out of line by how they've been acting. But that's all whole thing. And so even if the karma unresolved, unnecessary, unclean evil, simply put, and, and again, this is where you can feel free to connect to correct me. I did some research and some study and some question this week, but I did I exhaust the entirety of the knowledge in the world. No, no, I only had to go. And that's impossible. <laughs> but I spent some time 
Because I do want to make sure that when I say things that I'm correcting them, I don't want to give you bad information. That is one of the last things that I want to do. It's way at the bottom. It's not, maybe not the bottom, but it's way at the bottom. Simply put, whatever belief system or non-belief system that you want to put in place of God has not solved the problem. Whatever belief system you have has not eliminated the world or has not eliminated evil and pain and suffering in the world. When we boil it down, every attempt at explaining evil seems unsatisfactory. None of them deal with it. It's still there. If anything, this shows us that there are no easy answers. But removing God from the equation does not help us to understand it. It does not move us any farther along. It doesn't bring any better clarity because nothing else is out there. Even without God, we still experience pain and suffering. And so maybe the problem is, as Albert Einstein once said, the real problem is in the hearts and minds of men. It's not a problem of physics, but of ethics. It's easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil from the spirit of man. I have no idea how to denature plutonium. I don't even know what that means, to denature plutonium. I, I, I could Google it and I could start, but I could figure it out. But his idea, what he's getting at, is that the problem is in all of these other things out there. The problem is what's inside each and every one of us. And I think that we can agree with that. But we can kind of come alongside what, 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 what Einstein is saying here because we believe there's a sin problem that, that is in with each and every one of us that leads us to these things. And so there's a good chance that you know the story of Adam and Eve. And, 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 and if you're talking to people who don't believe in those stories, they would argue that, that whether or not this event literally happened, a garden, a talking serpent, a forbidden fruit, and that's not the, the point of what I want to get at today. What, what matters is that what that event describes still happens today. Nothing has changed in our world since that moment. Given the choice between trusting God or trusting our own instincts, given the choice of trusting God or doing what we want to do instead, we almost always choose to do what we want to do. Almost all just choose what we want to do. We are still rebellious children playing with matches. Or doing whatever it is you told them not to do. And they went and hid it in their room or whatever else it happens to be. And every time we do it, we get burned. Every time we do it, we get burned. So here's what I mean. Whether you're religious, an atheist, a humanist, a Hindu, or whatever, we all have to admit to causing at least some of our own troubles. We have to admit that many of our wounds, many of much of what we experience in life is self-inflicted. I can look at my own times in life that I've been through pain and misery and, and want to say, I can't believe this is happening to me. I can trace it back 10 steps and go, huh, that's what this is happening to me. I did that. I brought this on. I allowed this to get to this point. You probably can do the exact same thing as well. So we have to admit that our wounds are self-inflicted, self-inflicted. This means that evil and pain and suffering we experience is on many levels. Much of the evil and pain we experience is on many levels our own fault. We burn ourselves and we burn others. We can all show the scars. We can all tell the stories of when we have been lied to, when promises to us have been broken, when someone has taken advantage of us for their own gain to, to push us down and lift themselves up. Evil and pain and suffering are consequences of humanity's selfish choices in which the cumulative effect, the growing effect, as, as, we, as we pile them back on, as we pile them on one another, we find that we live in a world of poverty and war and disaster and so on. Just turn on your TV, scroll through your feed. You'll see all of these things that are going on in the world. It's an escalation of the choices that an individual makes for themselves rather than for the God who loves them. So, so maybe we should be asking a different question. Instead of why does a good God allow bad things to happen, maybe we should be asking, would a good God eliminate pain and suffering? Would a good God eliminate pain and suffering? C.S. Lewis addresses this in his book, The Problem of Pain, and in it he argues that humanity desires not so much a good God, but a kind God. And there's a difference. A kind God cares not, this is what he says, a kind God cares not whether its object becomes good or bad, Providing only that it escapes suffering. And kindness is a big deal for us right now. It's a big word, I think, in the world, to, to be kind to one another. And so, and so he goes on and says, we want not so much a father in heaven who would rather see loved ones suffer much than be happy in contemptible and estranged modes, but a grandfather in heaven. And we all know the difference between fathers and grandfathers, parents and grandparents. When I grew up, there were rules in the house. 
When my kids go visit, there are no rules in the house. <laughs> Grandparents do what they want to do when they want to do it. Grandparents have an entirely different set of standards. That's what we want from God. We don't want hell accountable. We don't want, no, it's 10 o'clock. You probably shouldn't have that five-gallon bucket of ice cream. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. I had to call friends to sit That's what we want. But parents know, no, that's not a good idea. Your tummy's going to be upset the rest of the night. You probably shouldn't do that. Grandparents don't want kids to cry. Right now, I'm playing. You guys, you guys, you guys get what I'm getting. All right. What's my thing? And yeah, it's hot. <laughs> what we discover here then is that a good God may not eliminate pain and suffering from the world because they are used to accomplish meaningful ends. A good God may not eliminate pain and suffering from the world because it is used to accomplish meaningful ends. And my guess is that you've seen this work in your own life. I have absolutely seen it in mine. Then, so if you're watching the slide here, if I had it up, I had, there's a picture of Madeline. And I asked her if I could share it. And oh, you look good. Yeah. Yeah. I asked her if I, I could share you. it. Do what? I sent it. It was in your... Oh, well, no, I, well, I don't have it. Have it. I, no, I had one digitally. Not I have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just hold on a minute. Okay? <laughs> I found one last time well, digitally that I loaded into the, the PowerPoint. But you can bring it, yes. Anyways. How do you go about when you ask for the visual? So, now this is a visual when she's about three years old. So here's what we got. She's three years old, six years, she's in the swing, and you look at her face, and her right eye is closed over, okay? When Maddie was, when Maddie was born, she wasn't a pirate. She wasn't practicing to be a pirate every day of her life. But she had a, an issue, and her tear duct was clogged, and it wasn't open properly or something like that. And so she, she didn't really cry. It didn't drain her or something like that. So, so her eye would just get kind of squeaky with all the, the sleep or sleep or whatever you want to call it. Whatever that stuff is. It doesn't make sense. I don't know what it is. We get goofy with all that stuff and it would kind of, kind of fill over and close your eyes. And so the way that we remedy this, the way that we go, we just, we just wipe your eye constantly and frequently. And just kind of like, we laugh at her too. <laughs> my mother-in-law has a dog with one eye. You know, it's, it's almost exactly that, that, that same thing that happened. And, and, so, and so when this picture was taken, and you can't see right there, about the time the picture was taken, she contacted, uh, uh, or contracted bacteremia, which is an infection that kind of gets into your blood. And, and they, they, they traced it back to um, the, her tear duct being clogged and not I mean, whatever else, whatever's going on with it. And so the only way to fix that duct was to, was to place a temporary stint to hold it open for a amount of time until it could grow properly and do whatever it needed to do, and then it would be fine. But the only way to put the stint in is to strap her down to a table where she couldn't move, fully awake. And by fully awake, I mean screaming at the top of her lungs. And we were not allowed in the room with her. We were outside. We knew she was in there. We could hear her, right? <laughs> and now we, were having we could hear her down the way, screaming. You know, we're outside. We're, I, we're down the hall, I think. And I think we're right outside the room. And we could hear her screaming. And so, and, and absolutely, as parents, we don't want her to cry. We don't want her to experience that misery, that pain, that, that frightening, that whatever she's going through, uh, that, you know, upsets her, pain, whatever else. But if we had been swayed by her tears and screams, if we had been swayed by why is this evil pain and suffering happening to me, if we relieved her temporary pain that she was experiencing, then she would have eventually died from a much worse infection. And so we knew more about the situation than she did. And we desired the best for her, not just temporary relief of what she was experiencing. And this has to be, I think, how God looks at us. If he knows more about our circumstances than, than we do, sees all of these things, and again, nothing else gives you the answer. This is the only thing that gives you somewhat of a response that makes sense. If, if he knows more about us and more about our circumstances than we do, and he wants the best for us, because he says, I have come that you may have life and you may have it abundant, perhaps he uses painful experiences to better ends than we can see or imagine. He uses our pain and misery to do things that we can't even possibly think that he's doing. Suffering, then, is a game changer because it leads to something better. It's not useless. It's not just a nuisance. It's something that means something. And when things are going well and life seems easy, it can be really hard to see any reason to look beyond ourselves. And, but when the opposite is true, when life is hard and things are miserable, then we recognize immediately our need for assistance. We recognize immediately, I need help in this area of my life. And that pain and suffering that we're experiencing are the very places that God comes in and meets us. 
and brings us comfort and brings us peace and brings us, just settles us in those moments. If you remember the, the first part of the summer series, Isaiah 43 2 said something like this. You want to read that? You're here. Well, come on. All right. Oh, now I'm being great. So if you remember back to the first part of the summer series, Isaiah 43 2 says this When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And so God is saying, hey, it's going to come over your heads. It's going to come up against you. But hey, don't worry about it. I am there with you. I am holding you up. You will not drown from this. And how many of us have seen our faith grow through times of troubles? It's absolutely where our faith grows through times of troubles. It happens all the time. More often than not, pain, the pain and suffering that we experience is, is the gateway that leads us to a greater relationship with God. It, it's the gateway that leads us to a deeper faith. It's how we know God best. It's how we know God better. Again, Lewis speaks of this. He says that pain and suffering aren't meaningless, nor are they distractions and inconveniences all the road of life. Like potholes on George Mayhew. I added that part. He doesn't have any problem. He probably had some of that. But more often than not, the pain and the suffering we experience are the things that God uses to get our attention. He says, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, in our con consciences but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So there's a reason, there's a purpose in the pain that we experience. It is supposed to draw us back to God. And maybe if you're not a big fan, a fan of C.S. Lewis, maybe you're a bigger fan of Jane Austen, who in Pride and Prejudice says, we do not suffer by accident. I have no idea what reference she says. I just know that she says it. Someone else has read that and you know what that is. But she says, we do not suffer by accident. Whichever you prefer, Lewis or Austen doesn't make any difference. But look at the ancient Israelites as an example of this. Numerous times, repeatedly, over and over again, God allowed pagan rulers to attack, punish, and persecute his people <coughs> in an effort to get them to turn away from their sinful choices. Don't you think they would? Why is this happening to us? Just like we do. In an effort to get them to turn away from their sinful choices and develop an understanding of life that, that, that life apart from God may the, the, the understanding that life apart from God may still be painful, but now it is also hopeless. Things are not going to be all hunky dory and fine and dandy for the life after God. Jesus said, You're going to have trouble. We can count on that. But at least with Him, we have the trouble to hold. Without Him, we've just got the troubles. And zero solutions, still, regardless of your thoughts. And I think that brings us full circle back to the original question Why would a good God allow pain, allow evil, pain, and suffering in this world? And there are no easy answers. That is not an easy question to answer. If anyone says, oh, and that's an easy one to answer, they have not processed through it themselves and realized, no, it's really not an easy answer. <laughs> but, there is, but I do believe there's one response. In allowing evil to persist, God is delaying judgment upon those who have not found and accepted the good news of who Jesus Christ is. Were God to rid the world of evil today, that means all of us are gone. None of us are here. None of us are here. We're all gone. He's going to rid the world of evil, then we all have to go. I don't, have, I don't care how good you think you are. You have to reference it against something. You don't know that a line is crooked unless you have a straight line to reference it to. Or a wall to piece of paper. Like we're all bad. God's going to rid the world of evil. Of the things that are causing all the problems, it's us. He would have to remove every single one of us. And if he did that today, there would be millions of souls. Probably billions, right? Aren't we somewhere around 8 billion people in the world? Billions of people lost for all of eternity. And so maybe, in God's eyes, this lesser evil of allowing a temporary suffering, which he can get us through, his presence will allow, will empower us and embolden us and, 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 and enable us to move through those things. He allows those to happen so that the millions and billions of people have time to respond to what it is God is to God calling them, wooing them, to being in grace. 2 Peter 3 9 says this The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And so maybe that's why there's pain and suffering still in the world. God is waiting for as many people as possible to come to know who he is. Even the God of the Old Testament, who gets a bad rap for being violent and murderous, you can spend any time and, and you'll hear those kinds of things as well, is also portrayed 
You can't pick and choose. You can't cherry pick the ones you want to choose. You can't cherry pick the ones that say God is violent in the world and then ignore the ones that where God gives wicked generations, wicked nations, several generations to turn themselves around, to repent of their wrongdoings. That's why we have the story of Jonah in the city of Nineveh. He gives them every opportunity to turn around. Or, or the law that God gives Moses, he says, hey, as you're going to go attack these other cities, I want you to first give them a chance to believe and accept them. We see that throughout the Old Testament. Or that God told Abram that he would not destroy the, the set Sodom and Gomorrah if there was only a few people in the city. And so God is this vengeful, but he is also this patient and love. And so it's easy to admit, I'll admit, that looking to God does not answer the question as to why there is evil in the world, why there is pain and suffering. No one has that answer. It is difficult for us to get. But, but here is the, the answer that I think we do have. And Jim Keller said this, and this and then we're done. If we again ask the question, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue? And we look at the cross of Jesus, we still, not, we still do not know what the answer is. We have a question. Why does God allow pain and evil and suffering in the world? We look to the cross of Jesus, we still do not have the answer. We don't understand that. We don't know the moment. We're back to page seven. We ask the question. We ask the question, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue? If we look at the cross of Jesus, we don't have the answer to that question. We're still going to go, that doesn't make sense. The good man, the only good man, the only sinless man, died and probably shouldn't have. There's tons of issues we should have that. But, but here's what Tim Keller says. He says, however, now we know what the answer isn't. This means much more than He says, however, now we know what the answer isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes our misery and suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it on himself. And so we don't look at the cross and find the answer of why there's pain and suffering. But we look at the cross and we know what the answer isn't. It isn't that he doesn't love us. The cross says the exact opposite. It does not say he doesn't care about us. It says, no, I care deeply about you. It doesn't say you're meaningless and insignificant as the world, as, 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 as nature, as naturalism wants to teach you, that you just, you're just part of the universe and the universe can care less than you live about. It doesn't mean anything. It cannot be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes our misery and suffering so seriously that he's willing to take on, take it on himself. He absolutely loves us. That's what we see. It doesn't eliminate the pain and suffering. It doesn't eliminate the evil. Nothing does. Nothing does this side of heaven. But this tells us why. And this says the opposite of what we do, that God absolutely does love in the midst of all of those things. The questions that we have are great questions. And, and any answer to those questions probably makes us a little uneasy. Because we start assuming things in the mind of God that we cannot necessarily know. But the Bible teaches us about a great God who works all things together for his glory and for the benefit of his people. That's the God that we are to be in our life. It is undeniable that suffering and evil exist, but, but at least for me, and probably for you as well, and maybe you haven't made this decision, but lots of still in any moment. It is comforting to know that it does so, that evil exists in a world in which God has raised Jesus from the dead. Evil exists in a world in which God has done the impossible. Evil exists in a world in which God has said, not only have I come into it, but I have overcome it. And so evil exists in a world where God is active. Therefore, even when I don't know why certain things happen as they do, and, and, and absolutely, I wish that things did not happen to me that sometimes I do, I still have the assurance that God is doing something in it. There is no other answer. No one else saw the problem. They just live with hopelessness. It's life in Christ is the only one that says evil, yes. I told you it's going to be there. But hopefulness that you can't do it. So I hope that answers the question. That's all that you know. You guys gonna walk out of here and never experience pain and evil and frustration and suffering in your life? Absolutely. You're gonna have it maybe even you, you may even stuck.
Some of you know who Paul Allen is. Wow. Because Wes didn't fix it when he was here. Yeah. <laughs> Take the risk. <laughs> no, but it's kind of <laughs> we did not put an end to something evil in the world. We cannot. No one can. Only God can. And he'll do it once he comes back. In his glory, he says, hey, now it's time for you to come back and set this new guy's world. So there's an answer to the question. Well, we learn a little bit and you can kind of push back and you can give a little bit of an answer. Is it going to solve every pushback that they have? Absolutely not. But it gives you another up to kind of go, well, what do you believe? And why does being an evil existing rule? You eliminate God. I'd be interested to know what the answer to that question is. I didn't find it. I didn't find it. I didn't scout it. Thought that. But I don't think it's there. I will pray. Lord, we're just grateful and thankful for who you are, your love, your grace, your mercy, and your sending us each and every day. And so, Lord, we're glad, we're glad that you are this kind of God. There are a lot of things that we do not know, that we do not understand about you. There are a lot of things that we do not get when it comes to why you do the things you do. But, Lord, you make it absolutely clear beyond a shadow of doubt that your love for us is one of those things that we do not question. You are Emmanuel, you are God with us. You didn't send a, hey, here's a message. Here's a note that I want you to guys, oh, you said, hey, I'm gonna send a son. I'm gonna send my child so that, so that you know <coughs> that I love you deeper, that I love you deeper. And so we're grateful that you've done that for us. Lord, we're grateful that, that we, we, we knew ahead of time. Lord, we don't question sometimes the evil and suffering in the world because we know you said, hey, you're gonna have it. It's gonna be there. You're going to have trouble. There's going to be all of these things. And so we're, sometimes we just kind of discount it and go, well, yeah, it's, it's God moving through. We knew these things were going to happen. But, but to a world that thinks it should be perfect according to their standards, that any evil, any pain, any suffering ought not be there. And so they really need to find an answer for it, to, to reconcile what they already believe in their mind. So Lord, help us to lean into those conversations. Help us to, 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 to ask the, 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 the pressing questions. Help us to not walk away from people who are genuinely seeking or, or from people who have never even processed the questions. Help us to lean in and say, well, what about? Or could this be possible? Or not in the sense of, well, you're wrong and this is why. But isn't this just a, as a viable solution as your non-solution or as your solution? Isn't this just as possible? And Lord, we get to engage. We get to be a part of the conversation. And, and maybe even in some way we get to make a disciple, which is the thing that you called us to do. And so, Lord, lead us, speak to us, guide us, draw us to your word, draw us to the deeper things of you, not just the reading the Bible and the what do I need to do today, but, Lord, how are you affecting not just the hands, not just the heart, but, Lord, how are you affecting my mind and how I live and how I interact and how I intellectually process the information that's around me. How do I speak to people in a way that doesn't sound like I'm just repeating talking points, but I'm sharing the experiences of what I've known and learned and understood? So Lord, help us to be those people. Those are the people that we're supposed to be. Those are the people you called us to be. Those are the people you empowered us to be. So Lord, help us to be those people. We give you all praise and the glory and the honor. In your holy and precious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So that's week two. You can tell me what three is. I there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Next week we're going to talk about hypocrites because that's another big problem. Is that non believers now in the church? just a whole bunch of hypocrites, right? So we'll address them that. We'll find a little bit of a have a great week. We'll work on this with our line. If anybody wants to go figure out what pole is now, then Bro would probably appreciate it. Okay, well, everybody knows. Do they know? Can you let the Bro know? Can we hold them up? Just have them out. Oh, okay. Have a great week. See you next Sunday at 10 a.m. or online, but at least on site. We need an exit song. I'm going to try. Oh, I want to see you. I like to see you.